Hello, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. I'm here with Wayne Woolridge, co-superintendent of SAU 29. And um, it's about the second, probably about the third time that um, you've been on the show. You always come well-dressed, shop. I had to dress up because, you know, got to meet the, the quality of our guest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you being here. It's been kind of rough the, the past couple of weeks for you concerning um, the possible closure of um, one of the elementary schools in Keene? Absolutely. Uh, we have uh, kind of the midpoint of a process that began in uh, March of 2012 when the board uh, commissioned an advisory committee to come up with a way to cut costs at the Keene Elementary Schools without compromising the program uh, for the students. And that committee spent 14 months, eight public hearings, uh, did a lot of research and ended up coming uh, with a unanimous recommendation to close one elementary school and to create narrow grade spans for the others, uh, a preschool through grade one and a K-1 school. So when they did that, um, and the, the board then presented to the board, the board voted yes, uh, you know, my charge was to come up with the elementary school to close. That was a very difficult uh, decision and it's been a difficult conversation uh, for a couple of reasons. I, I moved to that attendance area um, I, with uh, three children who attended there. I was principal of that school and and to name Jonathan Daniels as a school to be closed was extremely uh, difficult. Um, but when we looked at the numbers, an architectural study that had been done, it was clear that it would be much more expensive uh, to renovate Daniels to make it fit into that four school model and that there were some structural issues around uh, Jonathan Daniels that we would have to take care of. Um, and as a, as a way in which to move the conversation forward, it, it was the, the school that was clearly um, out of the five, the one that was inferior. Uh, Wheelock, which others had... Oh, when you talk inferior, you're talking construction-wise, in, construction facility-wise, not, oh. not school-wise. Actually, if you look at Daniels uh, as, as the area around Daniels, great playgrounds, great parking, uh, wonderful area of the, you know, of the city, close to the new middle school. I mean, so location-wise, Daniels is a marvelous location. So I'm just talking about the facility so, sorry, sorry. Uh, and you know the interior uh, of the space uh, for the students, uh, the amount of space, which is much less than the other buildings, the way in which the classrooms are configured, which enable you really to only have 18 students in a classroom at Daniels. I mean, there are right down the road some issues. Uh, Wheelock, which had been the other school that people had thought should be closed, turns out. A uh, huge renovation done in 1979. It's par partially sprinkled, and according to the architects, it's the structurally, structurally, it's the best school that we have in Keene. So, to take Wheelock, which has uh, more students than Daniels, uh, off of the grid and leave Daniels and the other three would have been really problematic to make that four-school model go. So. Uh, made that recommendation to the board uh, October 25th, uh, went around to all the PTOs, uh, met several times with the PTO presidents and the elementary principals, met with the faculty at Jonathan Daniels, the PTO there twice. Um, since then, I've also met with the faculty at Wheelock and trying to get a sense of how we can move this conversation forward. On the 30th, last Wednesday, uh, we had a, about 150 people at the Keene uh, Auditorium and uh, presented kind of an overview of the process to date and we took in some public input as we had the board there uh, listening to pub the public react to this plan. Uh, then uh, the board in December at the December board meeting will vote to move this conversation forward. If they do move the conversation forward, we'll set up a steering committee in January, uh, five subcommittees that will look at various aspects of the plan, create an implementation plan that would be ready for the board in October with a public hearing sometime in the spring. Board would either vote or not vote to move that forward, and if they did, in March of 2013, there would be a bond on the ballot, which would include about a $5 million renovation for the other four schools, the stuff, much of it we have to do. <laughs> life safety issues, for example, but there's also efficiency issues around boilers and difference in temperature of about 20 to 30 degrees in some schools. So there are some issues that we have to take care of. That would be voted on in March of 2013, and if it were approved by 60% of the population, 
Uh, then uh, on July 1, 2013, we begin construction or renovation of those four elementary schools. So about a $5 million bond, about 4% or so given today's uh, market. Um, it, even with that $5 million renovation, a 20-year bond, we would still save over a million dollars annually. So every year as we look forward, we'd save about a million dollars. Once the bond payment, uh, if you wanted to really s stretch it out, once the bond payment was over, your increased uh, savings, you'd have over a million dollars. So that's what the, you know, the committee, when they looked at how to cut costs, keeping all the programs that people in Keene value, uh, you know, the world language, the art, music, PE, um, you know, the great library uh, programs that we have, uh, technology programs, the things that, that really kind of make Keene special. Uh, people didn't want to give that up, and students deserve those programs, especially uh, today. So I, you know, I, I think as the community grapples with this decision and the representatives for the community, Keene School Board, uh, it'll be very, you know, it's going to be difficult. Anytime a community changes, and you know, last time we really changed, 1980 went from seven to five elementary schools in Keene. Since 1980, we really haven't redrawn district lines. Everything has been almost as it is today. Uh, meanwhile, our population has dropped uh, dramatically, our student population, as it has all over New Hampshire, not just in Keene. But um, we, can, we can get by with four schools. Uh, the Keene you know, taxpayers have been generous and have been willing to support quality program. But at this point, we have a situation where we probably, I believe we can, uh, do move forward and definitely improve our facilities, the four that we have left. Uh, not sell the land to Jonathan Daniels. I would suggest we keep that space uh, and and save the district uh, over a million dollars a year. At the same time, we're looking at some revenue uh, issues. Looking ahead, I mean, I, I know it's anything <coughs> can change politically, but the reality is, you know, the super committee in, in their failure. I mean, there's a lot of things. Colossal that are, failure. Uh, One point two trillion now is on the table and is mandated to be cut unless something really surprisingly happens. Uh, that $1.2 trillion cut will result for Keene uh, in a cut of about 7.8% of our special ed funds from the state and the same for our Title I. So we will lose over 100000 next year uh, unless something really surprising happens um, in Congress uh, in, in early, you know, in this winter, and I don't see that. Likely, I think it'll be after the election <coughs> before anything of that magnitude would show up. One of the things that was seemed to <coughs> really ticking off some of the people, and they would go and say, well, what's a million dollars? But I don't think they were looking at, over a 10-year period, you could be looking at a cumulative amount of 12 to $15 million Which in savings. a brand new elementary school. And that's what, when you're going looking ahead, yeah. part of it is, when we look at our schools, where, we, where are we going to be 15, 20 years from now? We may be having to look at a new yeah. elementary school or like some communities, they have a combined elementary school. And if we're spending 10, 12, 15 million dollars that we're not getting the best return for, we may not be able to right. afford a new middle school 20 years from now. Yeah. And <clears throat> the other thing I think people were, were getting tied on was money. I was doing a bunch of reading, and um, it said, especially <clears throat> for women with children, it said two of the most critical things that they view themselves as a success is the quality of education they give their, ch their child gets mm -hmm. and the health and welfare of their children. Yeah. And so closing a school really for, without being sexist or anything, but looking at it, for, for women, in a lot of cases, if you have school-aged children, that could be pretty traumatic because now your question is, is my child's education going to suffer? Mm -hmm. And if I'm judging myself on how great of education my child gets, not only does it affect my child, it affects me personally. Mm -hmm. But being on a school board, and it's one of those we don't always like to talk about, but the education committee is trying to fix, is we have five elementary schools, quote unquote, we're supposed to have the same reading, the same math, but somehow it's not all being taught the same. And by the time the kids get to the middle school, you really have had kids who may have gone through five different reading programs, mm -hmm. then you gotta fix them at the middle school. Right. One of the benefits 
of going to the, the proposed um, the shift in the division was the kids, no matter where they are in Keene, have a heck of, will have a heck of a lot better chance of getting the same quality of education than they right. do right now. Right. Yeah, the students would actually know half of the <coughs> students uh, that enter at, at sixth grade into Keene Middle School. They would have had the exact same program as half of the students and more likely a similar program to the other mm -hmm. half. They will have had um, a similar professional development program relative to the staff in both of those schools. The Keene Middle School teachers that get those will have a, uh, not as much variety of background relative to instruction and therefore there should be less transition uh, in regards to remediation mm -hmm. to get students to where they, they should be in the sixth grade. So I mean there's some big advantages in addition to the ability to target professional development, uh, professional learning communities which is important to Keene, uh, having four to five uh, teachers at a given grade level will enable us to do some things that we probably couldn't as far as sharing resources, as far as targeting, you know, that kind of thing. And if you look at those narrow grade spans as, as we talked about, being able to target art programs, music programs, your library, your playground, you can definitely help focus on that developmental span um, when you narrow grade spans. And that's, that's probably a big issue. Th also that equity, currently, I mean, you have principals with almost twice as many students in some schools. You have reading specialists with twice as many students. Uh, huge variety in class size, which the narrow grade span <coughs> would help. Uh, so you have students that are in a less advantageous uh, or more advantageous program, depending on where they are and what grade, uh, than others in the city. So it would be a way to help make certain that everybody received the same support relative to resources and, and that teachers uh, would be availed some, some collegial support as well under the narrow grade span. So I, I, the committee really thought hard about that and when you look at the 18 member committee and some of them that were excited uh, about it, you know, our mayor elect for example, mm -hmm. um, that narrow grade span idea helps solve some long term uh, problems around equity uh, in the city of Keene. Uh, and it would be a big advantage to our staff uh, to have that kind of environment. Now, there were, as you remember on the 30th, uh, a number of parents who were concerned about uh, an extra transition. And we've talked to um, superintendents, uh, principals who have dealt with that extra transition. There are ways in which to make that more, more of a celebration than a surprise and getting like first graders for example to, to the new second grade and having second grade students talk to them about what happens in second grade and making it, make it more of a celebration and remember they'll be going with many more students into that new school so uh, there are you know some things that we can do to help mitigate the any harms that might be caused by an additional transition and then when you look at all of the comparative advantages uh, with a narrow grade span I think the committee was was unanimous that that was a positive move for Keene and if it's really about l student learning and the ability of a student to be prepared for the middle school and then for, for the high school and for college and for life uh, the, the ability to really target especially those early early grades that numeracy and literacy that those very K-1 schools would be t focused on um, should make certain that those students will be less likely not to be able to read in grade level or above by the time they hit second or third grade. So there are some learning advantages in the narrow grade span. There are some issues around change in a community that is always problematic and when it, as you mentioned, and it's personal, you know, my child, um, it, it's very hard to kind of look long term where will my child be in, you know, the kindergartners right now graduating in 2025? What will the world be like in, in 2025? Well, I would suggest, and there's a lot of research, that many of the careers these students will be going into haven't been invented they yet. Yeah. Right. So they, we need to make certain that, they're, that they are ready. We need to make certain that they're ready to compete globally. And we have been falling uh, since Nation of Risk in 1984. Yep. There's been a lot, you know, the public support for education has declined in many communities and as a result uh, and I don't think it's a surprise our <laughs> standing internationally uh, has declined as well. Um, Keene hasn't fallen for that. We don't have 30 students in a classroom. We're not cutting everywhere. We are still supporting public education. Um, it, but at this point in time with the state revenue we could lose yep. 1.6 million in the next biennium <coughs> if uh, once the adequacy law 
Uh, we're currently in a two-year biennium. Uh, there is no more building aid at this point. If you looked at, uh, you know, Keene, we've received about $17 million in building aid for Keene Middle School. If we were to have that vote in March, uh, we'd get nothing. We'd have to pay for the entire $28.5 million of Keene Middle School. Those kinds of, you, you can anticipate the state revenue is going to be where it was a few years ago. Maybe years before that level, if, if ever. If it ever gets back. If the constitutional amendment is passed, I don't predict in Keene ever to receive the level of revenue that we get from the state, as, I mean, certainly in, in my lifetime. Uh, that that money would ever come back. And if people would like to just look at past history, prior to Claremont in 1997, even back though... Back in 2002. Or, to, you know... <laughs> we, would change, yeah. we, we received $4 million a year yeah. from the state. And that was at a time when they still knew that in the mm -hmm. Constitution, the state was obligated to provide a public education. If a constitutional amendment passes, there's no, no. longer that expectation. Uh, the year after, by the way, we received $15 million and a $10 yeah. million dollar tax cut to Keene property yeah. taxpayers. Uh, once we lose that protection that we have by, as a state, Keene stands to lose a significant revenue, long term. I mean, Port Portsmouth, for example, with $2 million of property evaluation per student, Keene with 695000 property evaluation per student, Portsmouth will likely be very excited about the potential of separating education by communities. You can imagine in Keene if we separated it by neighborhood. Uh, you know, there are folks who will just look at that, well, let me see, my top pocketbook, regardless of, you know, what has been said by our <coughs> founding fathers in our Constitution, would definitely see a increase in available funds if this constitutional amendment were passed and I no longer had to worry about communities that are not as wealthy as, as my community in Portsmouth or in, where in Lakes region, the seacoast, any of the wealthy, and there are many, and some in our region. Um, th so there's going to be a real kind of firefight. But whatever happens, I don't see an increase in revenue from the state. So this is an opportunity for Keene, you know, the Keene folks to say, you know, we can maintain our quality of education and still do this and get our cost per student a uh, little closer, you know, to a, a state average, even though that's certainly not what we're shooting for. Um, I, I think this, this idea is still a good one, and if people can be patient with us as we move it forward, in January, create a steering committee, come back in, in, in the spring and say, okay, what have we learned and what changes have we made to the initial plan, and let the board in October of next year vote on something to save the taxpayers' money, and, and I think it really has the potential to actually improve education in Keene. So this is really a win-win. Um, and I, I, having, you know, those folks in Daniels who live close to that <coughs> school, and there, there are probably a hundred, you know, in, in the two neighborhoods that are close, there are probably about a hundred students that would, um, you know, see a little longer bus ride, um, more like the bus ride that the Fuller students currently get. Very less than 10% of our students typically walk to school, and in you know in Jonathan Daniels and three of the other four uh, schools, it's it's not about walkers, you know, but it is about um, you know people being closer to a neighborhood, and maybe we could keep a playground there and some other things that that make that, or possibly a preschool might go. I mean, some other options that this committee might come forward with. They may you know take another look at the grade span to see if there's a way to modify that. There's some things some. That we where we could adjust this if if the community is will be patient with us and let us move this conversation forward. If they don't want to, you know, if they feel you know we, we really want to keep our five uh, elementary schools we have in Keene and we're willing to pay uh, extra to to maintain that, you know, that's fine too. But I think the importance is that people really understand uh, where we are and and how to move forward and what decisions are really crucial. Yeah, <coughs> two things, but the first. When we're talking again, going back to the quality of education, because people worry, because we're worried that we're so focused on cutting money. Well, we we have to. We ha it's not cutting money. It's making heck of a lot better use of the money that we have, fully wearing that we're not going to get money in the future. And when when one lady stood up and we're talking about, you're not supposed to compare to the state averages. And st well, when I was first on the school board, and I was telling. Joe Hoppick, who was the moderator, he was the chair. And we were really nervous and everything and figuring how are we going to go and tell the, the public that we're now going to be spending, we're going to give them a $40 million budget. Yeah. Then it went up to 50, and now we're at 60. And so 
I think what we're doing is we're not comparing ourselves really to the, the other state or the rest of the state. We're taking a, a really good internal look at ourselves. We've gone up 50% in almost 10 years. We've got less students. And, and anytime you spend money, sometimes you really get your money or more than your money's worth on certain things. Other times you don't get what you plan. And it's really our responsibility to both the students for the quality of education and the taxpayers that we serve as both of them well. Right. And, and there are you know, certainly fewer, uh, a smaller percentage of households with children, around 8% uh, of our keen households have children 10 years or younger right now. So the majority of, of folks have been willing to come along with us around the support that we need. It's not that they have children or even relatives in schools today. It's not maybe like it was 20 or 30 years ago when that was very different, that demographic. We need to make sure that those folks know that we are looking hard. And I, I agree that this is uh, a path that we can take. It'll be proactive. Active. Uh, it won't be, you know, dependent all of a sudden on a big tax bill and, and people say, okay, flash, uh, we got to see some cuts. Uh, you know, we, we would like to get ahead of this curve. Even if we're able to go forward with this conversation, we're still a couple of years down the road before we're going to see some savings because we really are 2014 before we uh, have these uh, four buildings, uh, these renovated four buildings uh, taking our elementary students. So between now and 2014 is all conversation, no savings. If we don't do anything now, and the, a year from now, we get, we're hit with a $1.6 million increase or loss of revenue. Uh, the feds, federal government, uh, you know, whatever they give us isn't a significant yep. increase, won't be significant to our, our budget. Uh, you know that, well, about 13% of the home sales last year, the sales uh, in Keene were foreclosures, and that was like 1% in 2005. So we're, we are stressing some of our homeowners uh, with our current $30.80 uh, per thousand tax rate. It's very unfortunate that New Hampshire is yet to own up to the responsibility that it has to provide a quality or at least an adequate education for every student. That's a constitutional right and it's an obligation, compulsory right. Students don't have the option of going to school. They have to go to school. And, and to then say that, well, you know, they can do this for $3,450 and we'll give you a little <laughs> bit more for, I mean, that, that's bad enough. But to want to, as, as the constitutional amendment uh, will suggest, we have no obligation. Let each community fend for itself. In a state with a average taxable, uh, a taxable evaluation per student of about 300000 higher per student than we have in Keene, any time that inequity, any time the state separates itself from that responsibility, Keene has, it would just be almost impossible to imagine a situation where we would benefit. We need the, that state, we need our state to continue. When the state constitution was originally, and it read, education will be cherished, cherished, and people say, well, what, you know, cherished does mean. If you go back to a dictionary in that time, cherished was what happened when people died and they left their children. Yep. Their neighbors would, were expected to cherish those children as if they were their own yep. and take those children in. That was the idea. Um, that those po folks who wrote the Constitution had in mind when they said the state will support public education, will cherish public education, provide an education for all students. To, to think that because the connotation or denotation Ch of cherish, cherish has changed. changed and therefore uh, we can separate ourselves from that responsibility uh, is, is self, uh, is, is totally um, a, a way in which to divest from the public responsibility and the public good. And if we go far down that road, our ability to compete uh, internationally. It'd be non-existent. Right, we will, we will definitely decline. And, and the, the scary part to me is it may almost come to the point, if the constitutional amendment passes, it's almost gonna, could all very easily come to the point of we may need that people in New Hampshire may have a brown burst of board of education right. because it won't have to do with race, separate but equal. It's like saying is where you're born, yeah. or we'll keep treat you separately, but you're going to get an equal education. There'll be no way in the world if you're born in Keene or, or born in Hinsdale or Winchester that you even get a, an adequate education, let alone a quality education to, to go in and like I was telling to let 424 um, <clears throat> men and women who go, well, this is how much money we have, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna determine what's an adequate education based on what we're willing to spend. Right. And 
to me, can we do better in education? Yes. Can we do be more cost effective? Yes. But we can't go use it as an excuse. Well, you know what? We have some mistakes here. So let's really screw all these kids. Right. We're, and, and a lot of these kids, they only get one chance. If we fail them in K through three, a lot of the research says they never recover. Right. They never, ever recover. Okay. And, <clears throat> and I just think your, your job is, is really tough. I don't know how you go out at night, people. You might have to have a bodyguard, but it's really personal to the people. They really want a quality education for their children, but there is only so many resources. It doesn't look like it, it's getting bigger. The state wants to bow out. You have people at the federal level that want to bow out. And when you look at the resources, they're all bowing out. The local community I is tapped. But I think you and Wayne, Bill, and the other ones need to be graduated because you're being proactive and you want to ensure that the quality of education doesn't go down. If right. Keene's education go down, goes down, the city of Keene really ceased to exist as yeah. a city it is. Yeah. And Keene is, you know, so much of what attracts people to, the, to this area, including the business community, is the quality of education here. And we have been a, willing to pay for, for education even though it costs us, like I said, three times yeah. more uh, than Portsmouth uh, per citizen for a $100,000 house. And you can go on, I mean, Portsmouth, that uh, almost two million dollars. There are cities that in towns eight to ten million dollars property valuation per student. So we're willing to shoulder a greater ver burden, but to do it s without any support from the state at all um, is unconscionable. And to look at our taxpayers and say we found an avenue by which we can save some money and keep the program. Eighteen folks who are very representative of the entire community, eight public forums said we can do this. I think we, we need to move forward with this conversation. And I know that you know there are people who think we'll get our checkbook out and we'll keep writing checks. But the bottom line, in order to look ahead and make sure that five, ten years from now, that same level of support and that same trust that we have mm -hmm. with our community is there, we need to make responsible decisions when we can make them relative to cost. Education is more important than ever. We can't compromise, and Keene in particular is dependent on a quality education system. We can't wait until folks want to slash. The, that would change the character of this city in, in such a way. I moved here 21 years ago. I stayed here because of the quality of education. Uh, my children attended these schools uh, right through grade, right through Keene High School. There, it, this is a great place to be, to, to be educated. Unfortunately, federal revenue, state revenue, our tax rate, we, we are facing a kind of a crossroads, and I think it's time, you know, that we do our best to move this conversation forward. I know the board will be voting in December, uh, and, and I hope that we can, you know, continue working. We've got a lot of work to do. There are still a lot of good questions, and, and that was one of the reasons we had the forum on the 30th. We found some, you know, there's still some issues out there that we have to resolve. But we're getting, we're getting a fewer issues. We've, we've solved, or at least we've discovered many of them. We still have some hard looks at, at a few of these things going forward in order to make certain that our students not only are never disadvantaged in a change of this program, but even from the first day that we've got, we've got things in place to make sure that they go in and not, not worry, not anxious, but they're going into schools that are ready for them. And I think we can do a better job than, than we've done if we, if we put this plan together. And, and that's why I'm out you know, doing what, what I can to get the word out, and we'll continue to speak to groups um, that want. We're meeting with our legislators on Friday and at the SAU building to uh, talk to them about some of our issues. A big one is that building aid. We need building yeah. aid. Uh, we're <coughs> one of seven states right now without building aid, but if you look at the seven states that I'm talking about, you know we don't we don't have building aid. We were dead last before Claremont in regards mm -hmm. to our support for public education. If we had tripled the state support, we still would have been dead last. Now we've come up, but much of the money that we get is equalized property tax, yeah. which stays in the community. It's really it's a fake game. Well, <laughs> it's it's hard to yeah. say that state revenue in a in a in a way that would you know equal what's happening in other states. So we're we really are playing some games with 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 students in regards to our ability to fund them. In Keene, we've been up front, but I think it's time um, you know, that we do that. And when I meet with the legislators on Friday, uh, I'm going to lay it out. We've got to have building aid uh, to move forward. We have issues around 
you know, we've got to sprinkler our buildings. Mm -hmm. new, there's new code now that uh, we have to meet. And so we'll have to assume these costs regardless of whether this plan we goes forward. We pay five or six million dollars. We have to pay five or six million dollars no matter what just to yeah. stay in the old buildings. Right. And without building aid <coughs> and without any other savings to compensate, that will just be a bump uh, on the tax rate in Keene. So we've got some big issues. And I thank you, Chris, for inviting me on the, on the program today because I think you know, the more we can get this information, it's, you know, it's complicated. There's just so many, it comes so many Don't ways and it politically, for some, <laughs> there's an advantage in creating the real complexity. Case. Constitutional amendment is a it's, case it's in point. Uh, the <laughs> idea that this is really a way to get more money to, to communities that are really in need. What's stopping the legislature okay. from doing that? What's stopping the legislature from t taking the $3,450 per student and then adding money um, in addition to that for communities that are particular? So that issue is really Because if you look at the law, the law says that the state is supposed to pay 100% of an adequate education. For right. So if the state has said adequate education is 3450 bucks, once they issue a check for $3,450, we're free to do whatever we want with any additional money because we met the constitutional requirement. Yeah. Yeah, and <clears throat> I know we're going to wrap this up, and one of the things that um, you probably won't be able to talk, discuss it now, but maybe we'll talk about it later, because one of the things I heard from a, a number of people was the, the special ed right. problem. And special ed has very little to do with racial problems. It has to do with social economics. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you talk about the number of houses that are foreclosure. I read an article today that 39% of the houses in the United States are underwater, between 700 billion to a trillion dollars of underwater houses in the United States. Mm -hmm. And people are still losing their jobs. Or my wife lost her job at FedEx. She got another job, but she's only making 60%. <clears throat> well, if we were younger and we had kids, we would then be in a position of increasing the special needs roles to the community because we would no longer be able to provide a lot of those things that keep them. And now the school is going to have to pay a heck of a lot more money for special needs requirements that we never thought that we were going to have to because we never thought the environment, the economy was going to get this bad and stay this bad for such a long time. Right. And really when you look at New Hampshire, we're so vulnerable because so much, the highest percent in the nation of the actual revenue comes from local property taxes. So when property is hit <coughs> relative to other maybe income or investment income, as it has been for us, um, that just kind of expo exposes our vulnerability. Uh, it, it just once again <coughs> reminds folks that being so focused on just property tax for your revenue source has some real issues and, and luckily we had gone for decades where Basically, the property values had either maintained or, but that's a, it's a different place now. And it just so it shows you why if there was a way to divest uh, so that everything wasn't property tax. In our case, we have an obligation for the state to come up with the money. There's no reason they have to use property tax. Certainly locally, property tax is the only way we have to raise revenue, basically. So we don't have another choice. The state does. They can do a number of things to create revenue to help support their communities and help support education. So I'm hopeful that the legislators, I know that this session is you know, not, not just about money because it'll be the following year before they, they tackle the budget, but there are some issues that they can really deal with that would help support us in a time when it's, it's, it's difficult to maintain a good program. And as you noted, with the economy going down and social services being cut at the state level, much of that is being assumed by the school, by district. The school district. So we're taking, <coughs> we're taking that slack along with doing some other things. By the way, the, the narrow grade span program that we talked about in closing, would not, we have room for all the collaboratives that are in Keene. We're not changing Change special ed yeah. around. This plan has nothing to do with the change of special education. Um, that, that's another conversation we're trying to maintain. We're trying to look at the programs we currently have, make certain that we have space for those programs, make certain that we have space for students moving forward, and with four elementary schools, making sure that those four elementary schools meet life safety standards, and, are, and there's some efficiency things that we would like to include as well. But we'll be meeting with legislators. I hope that the, you know, the listening and viewing public will you know, do what they can to be part of that kind of statewide uh, legislative conversation. Uh, that's all on our website, uh, at the SAU 29, you can, the state website, you can identify your area legislators, you know, send them an email, remind them 
um, that schools are important to you and that as we move this conversation forward, especially around the constitutional amendment, as you probably know, I'm worried yeah. about that, yeah. uh, that we can't let that happen. Right now it's scheduled for referendum in November of 2012. There'll be the huge presidential <laughs> election. It could be buried uh, in that whole conversation. And if it <laughs> is, that would be, it'd be less likely that what's best for kids uh, and what is honest and truthful uh, would be the motivator of, of the vote. Uh, and we need to keep that out there. I know that the presidential <laughs> will get the front page and we'll be on the back page, but we need to keep the it in front of The president comes folks. and goes, our Constitution Amendment states forever. Right, right. And if we're stuck with that, uh, it'll change New Hampshire um, and really change Kansas. Thank you very and much. One little quick one. Even thought our tax rate went up to $30.80. When you put the county, the school, and the city, we actually raised $45,000 less this year from the team. That goes when you're talking about the, the, prop, the housing values have dropped. Yeah. And so tax rate went up, but there was actually, and so all three um, entities, taxable entities, actually spent less money last yeah. year than the year prior. Wow. And so we're saving, we're all cutting. Yeah. People want us to cut more and we're probably going to have to cut more. But all the taxable entities are working in, but that's a number game. The, as the property values go down, the total um, rate has to go up, but it doesn't mean you're paying more. Right. <laughs> Difficult to follow. <laughs> Difficult to follow. Well, thank you very yep. much, Chris. Thank I you. I appreciate it. Yep. I'm standing here at Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. It's unbelievable how immense this crater is. I lucked out. Many of the roads have just recently opened. They had something like 673 inches of snow over the winter. It's hard to imagine. 55 feet of snow. And we worry when we get a 12 or an 18 inch snowstorm. 55 feet of snow. This is one of the five national parks I have never been to. At the end of this trip, there will only be one national park left, and that's in Arkansas. Never had any reason to go to Arkansas and go near. Well, I've traveled through it, but to visit or anything, so I don't know when I'll ever get to there. But after I get here, Go to Mount Rainier in Northern Cascades. <clears throat> if you Yosemite and the volcano and this is any indication of the amount of snow, I'm pretty sure there's going to be plenty of snow up there. And hopefully the roads will be open so I can travel them all. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the little um, view, a uh, little video clip of the Crater Lake. I enjoyed it. It was pretty amazing being out there. Um, so tonight, it's, today is our little school session. And uh, part of the little school session is playing with numbers. And it, for example, recession. Are we in recession? Are we out of recession? Or what are we? And I'm going to use housing as an example. Prior to the recession, housing, there was about 2 million houses were being built every year. Then it dropped off. So let's make believe the housing is, is G GDP. So you have it 2 million, then it drops off to 1.5 million. <clears throat> Not too bad. Then it drops off to 1.2 million the second quarter. 
So now you're officially into a recession because we've gone two quarters in a row uh, drop off. Then housing kept on dropping to about 500,000. <clears> Dramatic drop off, so 25% of at its peak. But housing goes up to 600,000. Now we're no longer in a recession. We're out of recession. Then housing goes up to 650. So we're not out of recession. So what in, in the world of economics, we now have a growing economy because we've gone from 500 to 600 to 650,000. Well, so when you go and say growing economy, but right here, you're 1.35 million less homes being built every year. And so that 1.35 million how homes being built, that means look at the millions of people who are not working, look at the people who lose their jobs because these new homeowners are not buying um, furniture, they're not buying appliances, they're not taking vacations. And so there's the big effect. So that's part of the trick of the game. You don't have to, in a normal way, if you started at two, two million, you lost one point, you lost a million and a half, you would think that you would not be growing until after you got back to where you started. But we don't do that in economics. Economics is we don't care how far we bottom out. We can go all the way down to one. And if we go up to two, the next one, then we go up to four, then we can go and say the economy grew by almost 100% because we went from two units to four units. That's why the American people just don't feel comfortable and they feel like they're getting misspoken to or, or treated as if we're really ignorant, but that's the language uh, of economists. And in, anyone in business knows you don't, you, if you do your business right, even if you have reduced sales, you can still be very profitable. And matter of fact, what companies have found out as the sales went down, they got rid of people, they made people more efficient, they bought new equipment, and now as the um, productivity is going up, their profits are going up, even though their sales may not increase. Again, that may sound confusing, but it all comes down to, to efficiencies. And <clears throat> like Jack Webb, who used to be the CEO of General Electric, said, four, the difference in four years, the American economy is producing the exact same thing it was doing four years ago, except with 6.2 million less workers. That's efficiency. And so the economy has not recovered from four years ago, employment-wise, but you can still make major um, profits. And so that's what they've been able to do. <clears throat> okay, now we move on to the 99ers. Taxing the rich, it's every place. What is the top 1%? You go and ask people, who are the top 1%? I was going in and doing research. 17% of the top one are doctors. 8% of the top one are lawyers. Only 14% are bankers or work in finance. 30% of one are CEOs of non-finance companies. Depending where you look. Three to five percent sports figures, actors, musicians. And according to this article, the select club of the top one percent include more information technology specialists and engineers than it does entrepreneurs and more scientists and professors than celebrities in arts, sports, and media. Not incidentally, 
more than half of the U.S. senators and member of the House of, of Congress are part of the top 1%. Never thought of that. So what we're doing is we're asking the people that we've elected to Congress, who are over 50% of them are in the top 1%, we're asking them to help us. And so we need to go, whose self-interest is more involved? Are they worried about their self-interest or are they worried about our interest? That's up to you to decide. The other question is, what is the top 1%? They go and say $516,000 in income. The IRS says 341000 of adjusted gross income. <clears throat> the funny part is it says income. It doesn't say wages. Okay? For example, Tom Brady... <clears throat> Let's see, LeBron James made $32 million. If he made 10% return on his um, <clears throat> investment, uh, if he invested that money, he would have $3.2 million in income. Income is everything total, okay? And for a lot of people in the top 1%, this 506 income has nothing to do with wages. And so, again, we have to ensure that you know the difference between income and wages. Also, 341K of adjusted gross income. Well, you can go in and get, get say, $516,000 in wages, and you can use tax breaks and other ways to hide the money and get rid of it. So, for example, I may have got 516,000K in income and may have come up with $170,000 where I could put and hide, take tax breaks and tax benefits and make an investment so I didn't pay my taxes on 341K instead of 516K. So just want a little go. This is what makes up the majority of the um, top 1%. Top 1% 1 is either 341,000 on your tax return or 516,000 or more totaled on um, total income. So. Again, just something short and sweet. And so, again, we're just going to look for some more little fact figures. And so, I want to thank you, and I'll see you out there on the long road.